All right, I'm going to start reading it. In everyday life, we have items we use for both pleasure and out of necessity. One such item I find pleasure in is tea. I wasn't always a tea drinker, and neither do I consider myself a tea connoisseur, if there is such a thing. Various teas have different and interesting spices. They taste and smell great and can be consumed hot or cold for many reasons beyond taste and aroma, many of which are holistic and medicinal. A common way to prepare tea is to use tea bags submerged in hot water. Have you heard it said that Christians are like tea bags? Something we all use out of necessity are trash bags. We need not explain much regarding trash bags. Their purpose is pretty obvious and cannot be overlooked. Try running your household without using them and let me know how that works for you. I like to say that Christians can, can either be like tea bags or trash bags. I'm almost sure saying this is an introduction that it will not go popular, but it has its purpose. It should help spark something inside of you to pay close attention. Which do you think Yahweh would rather use? Which would you choose to be if you had a choice? Oh, and by the way, you have a choice. Now for the reading of God's holy scripture. And the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I may show these signs of mine among them, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and of your grandson how I have dealt harshly with the Egyptians, and what signs I have done among them, that you may know that I am the Lord. Exodus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. Exodus chapter 4, verse 10. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. That's Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. That's Job chapter 1, verse 20 and 22. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we want to slow down our hurried pace of life. We want to come. We want to rest in your holy presence. We want to ask that your spirit would indeed descend upon each and every one of us, that as we have your holy writ, open in our hands, that equally so is our heart, equally so is our mind, our spirit, that we need to understand, that we need to take on the challenge of what scriptures say about us in connection to being like a tea bag or being a trash bag. I can't thank you enough for the heart represented here, that the receptiveness to that which you have uh, displayed through your scripture will be as evident to them as it was to me. Thank you for the capacity to stand here on your behalf and to be a conduit of that which your holy writ has explained for centuries. We praise you. We just ask you now to once again be the host of our get-together. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Welcome to everyone. And uh, if you have not seen me here yet before, I don't know if anybody is here that I have not met yet, but my name is Manny Fernandez. I get the blessed opportunity to today stand in the in the gap for Dr. Jeff. Normally he would be the one up here doing his, uh, the teaching. I would normally do his introduction, but today I get to do both. Uh, him and his wife are enjoying time away as I, I think I have the, the dates correct. This is their uh, anniversary weekend. So it's uh, obviously a, a much, uh, much needed time to uh, pour into the, the life of a marriage. You need to be able to keep that uh, functioning the way that, that God desires for it to function. So I hope and pray that uh, after services you'll join me in prayer for the, for the two of them as they are always doing ministry work. We just had a great fellowship time here um, on the, on the egg, egg wrap day uh, uh, right after the New Year's. If you, didn't, if you missed it, I'm so sorry. You'll have to wait again for, uh, for the next year to come. It is a fabulous event. If you have never been here for that, you certainly want to come back and make it. Um, in, in regards to the introduction of the ministry, the name of this ministry is Kingdom Embassy Ministries. Uh, we do have a website that is uh, just morphing into a gigantic, uh, gigantic piece of information. We have thousands of pages of, uh, of, of 
uh, teachings and we have videos uh, going back now to two years. I don't think the videos go as far as back as two years, but uh, quite a while uh, we started uh, doing this, this, uh, this recording and we upload the teachings after that. On that same website, you'll find other resources in regards to the Feast of Yahweh. You'll find uh, resources in regards to the four pillars of this ministry, uh, which we, I used to uh, recite all of the time, but people were just kind of like not always listening to it. So now I tell everybody, just go back to the website because that's one of the ways that I'm going to hook you into going to the website. And then once you're there, you can read all of the pillars of this ministry. And so also there on the top right-hand corner, you'll see the donation button if the fact of the matter is that you find this ministry to be your uh, congregation and you would like to participate financially, we will welcome that just as well. Why would I title a message like this, tea bags or trash bags? You've heard it said, I'm sure that if you've been a Christian for a month or two, very, very short, you would have heard somebody teaching something along the lines of the fact of a Christian being like a tea bag. And we like that. That's always a good thing to hear because if you know anything about tea and if you don't know a lot, I'm going to use my little contraption that I, that I brought over here uh, just to kind of display what I, what I see in Scripture and what it is that I see in regards to all of us being a tea bag. But the one that I don't think I've ever heard is any one of us being like a trash bag. Uh, I'm, I'm not so sure that, that that book title will sell very well. I don't think that that will go very well on Amazon.com for a book sale. And so I think that there is, there is value in that title simply because as we read through, uh, through the scriptures and we already, we already into the chapter 10 of Exodus over the last few weeks, we've been talking about the life of uh, Moses, you know, at, obviously in the early parts after he started, uh, you know, he was sent down the river uh, in a basket uh, by the Pharaoh that did not know Joseph trying to uh, kill every child two, two years or younger. And then after that, now we talked last week about the names of God in, in the regards to who do I tell them sent me, which is part of something that I, I used to get to this position in regards to being a teabag. And so I want to tell you to turn your Bibles to uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31. You don't need to read the verse um, for now because that's going to be my central focus after I get through all of the Old Testament stuff. And I do want to use that verse uh, quite a bit to, uh, to drive the point home. Uh, for the fact of what it is that, I, that I'm trying to get to. But nevertheless, uh, the topic number one in my teaching is, is written this way. It says that tea bags are only purposely used when submerged, right? So there's no secret in that, right, that, that regard. I mean, obviously, for those who are not here, this is what I brought here today. And so if I have this tea bag in my hand and I, I have the, this is a loose leaf tea um, it usually you would put little leaves inside of the, the little mesh. But because it's visual, it's see-through, I figured that I would bring it this way, right? And so if, if, God, if God were to just have you in His hand like this and never submerge you, you would never release anything. And that's the reason why most people that do teachings always talk about the fact of being like a tea bag, because when you're submerged into something, there's something supposed to come out. And so this is what happened with Moses. Moses, in the, as I read already in the, in the fourth chapter, in regards to what, um, what uh, God told him to do in, in, uh, in, fourth, in the fourth chapter and the uh, tenth verse, but Moses said to the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent either in the in the past, or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. We come up with excuses like that. When, when God is asking us to do something, many, many times we'll always come up with some kind of a reason as to why it is that we cannot do that. In regards to Moses, he's using the fact that he's slow of speech. And if people have said that's because of the fact that he did not know how to speak that language anymore. He grew up as an Egyptian. He hadn't been practicing uh, Hebrew now. He, he was not able to communicate the same way. Some people say that he had a stuttering problem. There's all kinds of different things that they use to actually explain that statement that he made. But the fact of the matter is we don't know. But for us, the same purpose is that we can use any particular thing. If somebody told me today to go do something meaning uh, out of my comfort zone, I would probably come up with a serious reason in my mind to me it would be as, as palpable as this pulpit of why it is that I don't want to do it. And I think all of us are guilty of that. So we, don't, we can't be so hard on Moses because we would probably have said something the same way. 
So then the question becomes, how do you respond when God wants to enlist you for kingdom business? When he's asking you to do something that is seemingly hard, that is seemingly outside of your comfort zone, how do you respond? And the question for us to answer ourselves should be that we're going to go ahead and do it no matter what because we are going to trust that God is going to be in it with us to actually get us to accomplish that which he's asked us to do. This is what Moses actually endured because at the very beginning of this, if it were the fact of him listening to himself of what excuses he had given uh, Yahweh, he wouldn't have done anything. Now we know that the plans of God are always fulfilled and we're reading it past the event, so thereby we know that it actually was, uh, it, it came to a, a completion that Moses carried out what he was told to carry out. But nevertheless, he could have, he could have said no. Just like we do say no, he could have said no. So why must it be this way? Why must it always be the fact that we have to do things that are outside of our comfort zone? Well, because the contents on the tea bag, as I said earlier, this is topic number two, they're only activated in that environment. So the tea bag itself is you and me. God has got us in his hand. This water is the actual environment that's going to be affected. And this is what happened with Moses when he went into the face of Pharaoh to bring that which Yahweh told him to bring. The fact of the matter was, the moment that God put him in that environment, everything around him became to be impacted. Now we're going to impact things in a way where it's either going to be positive or it's going to be negative, but for this particular case, we want to be the ones that are impacting it for God's kingdom business. We want to impact it for that which is positive. I'm going to read Isaiah chapter 6, uh, verse 8. This is a verse that you guys have probably heard many, many times. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. And he said, Go and say to these people. And we won't read the rest of it. Because the accomplishment part of that was when he says, Here I am, send me. So the moment that God questions somebody, who, who shall, shall we send? Who am I going to send to do X, Y, or Z? I think the ones, the ones that are in, in a tight relationship with Christ should be the ones who raise their hands first. The problem with me, or the problem with many of you sometimes here, I would assume, if you're anything like me, is like we want to know what that, what that is that we're going to do before we, are, before we answer the question. If somebody says to you, my wife says to me, honey, can you do something for me? And I say, what is it? I'm not so eager now to respond in a positive way. I should say, yes, I, I, yes, I can. What do you need me to do? The question it needs to be answered in a positive way first, not tell me what it is you want me to do, and then I'll tell you if I can do it. And that's how we actually treat God a lot of times. God says to you, do something for me, and you say, what is it, Lord? And you're saying thereby, if I like it, then I'll do it. That's not the way that I say I answered it. Here I am, send me. He didn't say, what do you need me to do? He said, just send me. Here I am. Now Job, and, and, I, don't know, and I don't know if, you, if you've ever caught on to this, but um, I love this guy. This, this, <laughs> he says in the, in the book of Job, chapter 1, verse 20 and 22, it says, Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshipped, and he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. Why is that particular section of that book important to me? And I think maybe to you it should be important just as well. If you read the early part of the book of Job in, in this first chapter, he's presented, he's introduced to us as a blameless and upright guy. He's righteous, blameless, and upright. But then you know all of the craziness and the mayhem that Job lived through his life. Lost his kids, lost all of his possessions, lost cattle, lost everything. The only thing he didn't lose was a wife that told him, just go curse God and, and die. That's the only thing he didn't lose. But everything else he lost. He was placed in a position where even though living a righteous life, he, he still had to endure wrong. And then you scratch your head and you're saying, 
Why would that be? What, what, why would the, the righteous person, the blameless one, who's got everything that everybody at that time and even probably today would want to have, why would he have to live through those circumstances? Well, I got to tell you why. Because as he was placed in that environment and he was activated, everyone around him, even his friends, I'm mean, going to say that loosely, quote unquote, even his friends that were kind of challenging him about why it is he was suffering. They were trying to tell him that he was suffering because of his sinful lifestyle, that he was kind of like hiding behind closed doors, which is obviously not the truth. He was impacting their life by actually still worshiping God, still giving him praises, and still not willing to listen to what his wife was telling him to do. And in that, I think for us, whenever we encounter a negative circumstance where God has asked you to do something that is not very pleasant, and you actually still hold a very joy-stricken face. Those who are around you in that environment are going to be impacted. Now, the opposite is also true. If we want to act in a different way that most much represents a trash bag, you're going to impact that environment as well, but not in the same way. Because... All of the things that you find in a trash bag are not things that you would want to have inside of you, but that's exactly what the behavior is coming out like. And then we're going to touch more as, as we get to uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31. So it's one thing for us to, to, to praise God, to preach about God, um, when things are going great. But how about when things are not going so great? I know right now in this, at the beginning of 2022 here, as we've gone through these two years of this roller coaster, of this, um, I'm going to use um, a different analogy because we don't want to get ourselves ba banned of where we need to be. Um, this mandated brownies that are being pushed around on everybody. Um, what gives? And that's just, the, that's just the, mo the, the most red headline, I think, by pretty much anybody. So if you're finding yourself in a situation where you're being pushed against and you feel the, the winds in your face, it's not always the fact that, that God is not allowing you to go forward. He's just telling you to keep pushing ahead in the midst of that circumstance because at the end of that, there's going to be a reward. You know the life of Job, at the end of his life, he was rewarded for everything that he endured. He received that back, and I think, if I remember correctly, it says that he got that back sevenfold, right? Topic number three. A tea bag is a pass-through device, while a trash bag is a containment device. So, everyone knows this. This is no news to anybody here. You're not two years old, right? So, when I put the bag in there, and this is not hot water, which I... If I would have put it in here when I put it together, it would have cooled down by now. But the fact that the water in contact now with the tea is going to allow it to dissipate itself into the water. And so it's passing through it and allowing itself to flavor the water. And so that's, that's our life. That's what you and I are supposed to look like. The very moment that God pours something into your life, is supposed to pour itself out onto other people. A trash bag is the complete opposite. A trash bag... You didn't think I brought one, did you? Simple stuff. But a trash bag, I just put stuff in it, and eventually I'm going to throw it out if I'm just going to use it as a regular household device. But for the, for the purpose of the, the conversation, this is just for me to put stuff in and keep it. But I'm the trash bag. It's, I'm not giving you the analogy, the one that you always see where we, we got to put this down because it's going to weigh us down. No, I'm telling you about you being the trash bag or me being the trash bag. Because all I'm doing is I'm receiving things and I'm actually putting them down inside of me and holding on to them as if they need to stay there. And all they're going to do is they're going to fester. All they're going to do is they're going to grow and they're going to multiply. And you're going to see that when we get to Ephesians. I'll, I'll show it to you. It's as clear as a bell. I asked you to turn already there at Ephesians, so you can go there. 
And if I have it memorized correctly, we'll find out in a second because that's actually how I want to recite it. I believe it says in the New King James Version, it says, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor be put away from you with all malice, being kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Did I get it right? You got two verses. I'll turn there just to make sure that I... And I have the ESV translation, so I don't have it memorized in that version. But Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Look at the procession and the events that take place. Bitterness turns into wrath. Wrath turns into anger. Anger becomes clamor, and then it becomes slander. After that, it'll be malice, which in some areas it, it talks about, and the slander is the evil speaking, because we're mad at somebody. We, we got angry with somebody. We go and tell another person something about that person. It's not such a kind thing, but we just want to go ahead and put ourselves on a pedestal as if we're right every single time. And we want to hear ourselves talk because our feelings have been hurt. I got some shocking news for you. That's not the way God wants you to be. That's not the way he wants me to be. If I do something wrong to you, I expect you by the power of the word of God that you call me aside and you tell me that I did something wrong to you. I expect you to do that. I, I don't, I'm not walking... Um, here with a halo on my head. I make mistakes like anybody else does. And in the event that I make a mistake towards you, I would, I would rather hear directly from anyone's mouth than from somebody else's mouth. Because then now you failed God. And we have failed as believers in doing that. You know, I, I, I sound like a broken record when I say this, but I'm, I'm probably never going to stop saying it. Simply because of the fact that if we want to show it to anybody that we're his disciples, it's by our love for one another. You've heard me say that in the last two years. You've heard me say that probably over 30 or 40 times. But it never gets old. Because it's, by, it's the only verse that I have found in the Bible that Jesus used to, dis, to tell us what it is that describes his disciples. It's the only verse that I have found. There are many other things that we can talk about. We can talk about the fact of why it is that, um, that, that we know that, that a believer is saved. We can talk about the fact of why a believer um, is, is struggling in certain areas. But as far as the fact of me being a true disciple of God, that is the only verse that I have found that verb is attached to it. Not another one. And if there is, you can tell me later in the discussion time. I know that um, we have used also this verse several times here. In, the, in, the, in our congregation, Romans chapter 8, verse 29. And there is no shortage of ever using it, to be honest with you, because for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So now the, the motivation is not the, the end result that he has promised us, it is our love for him. That's the motivation. The verse that I just read to you, Romans 8, 29, is talking about the fact that he has already, in his eternal glory and knowledge, has already determined that he's going to turn you into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. That is his ultimate goal. The fact of the matter is that we don't want to be in the circumstance. We don't want to be in the hot water. Now, you can steep, hot, you can steep tea in cold water. Well, how long has this thing already been in here? You see much happening? Not a lot. If that water was steaming, right about now, it would be a lot darker. I use this thing not now as much as I used to, but every time I ever used it, when this thing was pouring vapor out of the top and I put tea in it, it would turn dark in a matter of a minute. Not right now, because that water is cold. But the circumstance in which, in which God allows you to be, the hotter it is, the better it is for you. 
because much more, much more is going to pour out of you of His kindness and His goodness and His grace if that is who is empowering you than if He puts you in just some lukewarm thing. That's the reason why He said in the Bible, I'd rather you be either really, really hot or really, really cold. Because if you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. And I got some shocking news for you. That's loving Jesus who said that. He doesn't like lukewarm. He wants you to be really on fire for him. And the circumstances that he's going to place you in are going to be equally as hot. And I'll tell you the reason why I know that. Uh, and I'm going to get ahead of myself, but it fits in what I'm saying here. And Proverbs 17, 17 and 3 says that the refining pot is for silver, but the furnace is for gold. And guess what? If you're his choice gold, you're going to be in the furnace. You're not going to stay in the refining pot. You can try to. You can choose to. But I'm going to tell you this. When God has a plan for you, you're not going to get away from it. You're just not. The hounds of heaven are not going to get away from you. That's a guaranteed fact. I know you can try. I mean, he's giving you the capacity to say no. But he has a bigger capacity than you do. <laughs> Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. I think that's a, also a memorization verse. If I remember correctly, I think it says something along the lines, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Is, is that correct? Or is that the next verse? Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Oh, no, that's the next one. Do, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. And so, we're always on our mind. You know, none of us has to get up in the morning and not think about the fact that we're hungry or that we need to brush our teeth or that we need to get dressed and we want to look a certain way. I mean, I know the majority of us stand in front of a mirror for quite a little while, making sure that our hairs are in place and that our clothes are fitting properly. But outside of that, outside of that, on the bigger, on the bigger items in life, we have to esteem other people better than us. And, and it's a hard concept for us to grasp. But I, I know that I had a hard time grasping it. But here's the, ki the killer part. It, I heard it many, many, many years ago, and it's called the universal law of reciprocity. It's not a, it's not a, a biblical item you're going to see spelled out that way, but it, it's proven in the fact of what, what God said in Malachi, that you cannot outgive me. You're not, you can test me on this. This is the only section of Scripture that I know where he has actually said to people, you can test me on this. So we think a lot of times that if we hold stuff to ourselves, that somehow, some way, we're safe. All we're saying to God is, I don't trust that you're ever going to give it back to me. I don't trust the fact that you're ever going to let me have it again. So now while I have it, I'm just going to grab it and I'm going to hold it. And I'm going to keep it because it's mine. No, but what if somebody else needs something? What if somebody else needs something that you have that you haven't done anything with for a long time? What is there? You just have it there because it just needs to stay where it's at. You're not esteeming other people higher than you. You're just hoarding stuff. And that's a human problem. That's not, that's not just a Christian problem. That's a human problem. Because before we became believers, we used to think like that. But those things are supposed to be getting purged out of our mind. I told my wife a long time ago, I told her, I don't know, many, many years ago, I'm trying to learn in my life how to live with less. We have too much stuff. And so we become like trash bags. We just want to keep on grabbing stuff. And we're putting bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and uh, evil speaking inside of us. Then on top of that, we're adding some, uh, you know, whatever things we're trying to keep in our life materially. And the list just keeps on going on and on. <coughs> the, fourth, the fourth topic, and I, as I was talking about the water, it's, uh, it's exactly that. It's the tea bag is most purposefully used in hotter circumstances. And I think I read it earlier in the book of Exodus, uh, chapter 10, verse uh, 13 and 14. Exodus 10, verse 13 and 14. 
So Moses stretched out his staff over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought an east wind up on the land all that day and all that night. When it was morning, the, the east wind had brought the locusts. The locusts came up over all the land of Egypt and settled on the whole country of Egypt, such a dense swarm of locusts as had never been before, nor ever will be again. There's something very interesting about the eighth, the ninth, and the tenth plague. The eighth and the tenth, especially, you can actually f read them for yourself. They don't, they're not localized to just the people of Egypt. Everybody on the eighth and on the tenth, on the tenth were subjected to the outcome of those plagues. You can read it for yourself. The ninth one, which is the darkness, talks about the fact that it was only dark over Egypt. They couldn't see each other for, I think it was three days. But it did not happen that way in the ninth plague and the, in the section where Goshen was. So the people of Israel were able to stay in the light. And why do I think that happened? Because it's a demonstration to us that if you're living your life with God, you're always going to remain in the light. The moment that you choose to be like Egypt, you're going to be in the darkness. Now the eighth plague and the tenth plague, the, the tenth plague being the one of the firstborn, we know why that actually is a universal one, because it's representative of the fact that we all need the blood of the Lamb. All of us. No one can escape that. The eighth one being the one for the locust, the one that the, the Bible, I'm pretty sure they got it, where it says that God is the one that owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and you're the only one that can restore that which the locust has eaten away. I'm sure if I were to go around this room and talk to you personally, every one of us has a past. Without a shadow of doubt, you could tell me things that you have lost, that you wish you didn't lose. But we, cert we read it earlier in my introduction where God is the one that has taken and He's the one that gives it back. Whatever it is that you think you lost and it's supposed to be yours, it's only temporary. It's only temporary. In the right time, in the right way, the fact of the matter was that it is truly yours and God wanted you to keep it, He'll give it back. We're not immune to the trials that this world brings. I know that's not any news to you. Jesus himself said it in John chapter 16, verse uh, 33. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. You know I, know, I know a lot of times we read a Bible verse, somebody comes to us and they, they're sharing with us their heart, they're telling us what they're going through in life, and sometimes we, we take the opportunity to prescribe a Bible verse to them. And it almost seems, to people, it almost sometimes seems heartless. But the reason why we do that, I know why we do it, I, I try to do it in the, right, in the right context. Sometimes it's not well received either. But the reason why we do it is because we have found the solace ourselves in that section of Scripture or in the Bible itself to actually present it to somebody else. In the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verse 10, Dr. Jeff didn't give me the light today. <laughs> Forgive me while I find it. I have to read it from verse 9. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich, and the slander of those who say that they are Jesus and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Here it is what I was looking for. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. Are you hearing that? And for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death. And I will give you the crown of life. I will give you the crown of life. You know, if the fact of the matter is that we're going to be conformed to the image of Christ, as we read earlier in the book of Romans chapter 8, verse 29, the fact of the matter is 
we're going to have to endure some of these things. We're going to have to live life sometimes in a way, and I'm telling you, in this country, us as believers, even till today right now, we have, we have nothing going on. I mean, if the worst tribulation that you have going on right now is the fact that somebody doesn't like the fact that you prayed before your meal at, at wherever it is you prefer to have your lunch, that's not, that's not tribulation. I don't want to break anybody's heart, but that's not tribulation. That's just an opportunity for you to start a conversation. That's just an opportunity for you to be able to ask somebody why they're offended and let them see the, 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 the truthfulness and the mighty hand of God at work in your life. Tribulation might be the fact that if you continue to talk to them and they want to hit you in the face, it might be a little different. But now it starts to get a little hotter. But as far as them getting upset at you because you prayed before you ate, that's not a real big problem. So that persecution that we might endure is a blessing. I think it's Matthew chapter 5, verse, um, verse 11. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute against you falsely. And how does the verse end? For my name's sake. For my name's sake. But we read that, and it sounds good. It sounds great. But it, the moment that it starts to happen is like, almost like the feeling of us taking our hand and wanting to put it on a hot iron. Obviously, in the physical sense, we don't want to do that because we know that's going to maim our hand. We're going to have blisters and we could lose skin or whatever the case might be. In the spiritual sense, that's basically the same comparison that we need to consider. We are going to have a developmental aspect taking place in our life based on that circumstance that we're going to endure. And I don't know when that's going to be. Prayerfully speaking, it could be in the generation when those kids back there are actually having to deal with it more. For us that are older, and I am older, so I can say this now, I just crossed the 50-yard 50, uh, 50 line. So I'm, maybe the guys that are in their 20s are going to have to deal with that a little bit different. So topic number five, tea bags release enjoyable spices and flavors, trash bags not so much. You know, I don't know about you, but I would much rather smell a cup of chai than actually stick my head in a, in a, in a trash container. And, uh, you know, the Bible doesn't make any mention, any direct mention about a tea bag or a trash bag or anything like that. But here's what it does make mentions of in, in Matthew chapter 5, verse uh, 13, right? Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, as we turn there. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. In some places it talks about a, a, a dung pile. What about chapter Matthew uh, 9, verse 50? Is that it? Did I get that correct? No, I didn't get that correct. So I scratched that because I don't see a verse 50 here. Colossians 4 and verse 6. Da -da -da. I should have checked that. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Every single time that we speak to somebody in a, in a, in a context of where there could be tone scales being changed, where your emotions may start running rampant, check yourself so that you can always think of yourself as actually having a little salt to pour in the conversation. Too much salt in itself is not good either. I'm, th you know, talking in the in the uh, in the culinary sense. But just the right amount makes it say, "Man, that really tasted good. That was great." And I think that's the kind of an impact that we want to have on people's life. Is the fact that whenever we are approaching an a, an individual for whatever the reason might be, and that you've already had sit a, a situation going on that would have allowed the the bitterness or the wrath or the anger or the clamor to take place or start to develop in that direction, try to reel that back. Try to reel that back because I know people who have left fellowships where they could have grown mightily just because of very, very small situations that could have been avoided. 
that they could have talked out, that they could have solved the way that the Bible tells you to solve them. Yes. But in the meantime, they allowed it to become this huge situation, and, and that ended up destroying the fellowship. As we start to um, close this time together, turn to James chapter 3, if those who have your Bible, James chapter 3, uh, verse 11. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and and salt water. Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine, produce figs, neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Pretty simple analogies, if you really think about them. There's not much secret in there. You hear people tell you the time, well, I can't read the Bible because, you know, it's too complex and I can't understand it. Well, I think a five-year-old can understand this. But nevertheless, it seems to be one of the hardest things for us to accomplish. We're being told by James, I'm sure you can figure out what he's trying to tell you, if, if we are walking our life according to the Spirit of God, we should be able to exercise self-control according to the fact of what Galatians says. And if we are walking about when somebody triggers you almost instantly, that's just symptomatic of something else. That person does not own your emotions. That situation doesn't own your emotions. The Spirit of God is the one that owns your emotions. And the very moment that something starts to happen, memorize a verse, think of something that is going to allow you to reel that back and say, okay, let me take that thought captive to the mind of Christ, which is what the Bible tells us to do. Take your thoughts captive to the mind of Christ. We always use that verse in a lot of different men's ministries because we're always talking about illicit behaviors where, that are way outlandish and way out there. It's not just for that. It even has to deal with this. In the very moment that you actually have something take place that derails your thinking and causes you to go in a different direction. So who's to blame? I mean, we, I talk to people quite often and sometimes they'll talk about the fact that uh, it's their upbringing, their past, their mother, their father, their genetics. And so now we're, we're going to put those circumstances above the power of God. Because he says that he who began a good work will complete it on the day of Christ Jesus. Who's telling the truth? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you. You don't have to answer, but I'm going to tell you. It's the Bible. It's Christ. He said it. He's going to complete it. And he's the one that began the good work. If that, if that message has uh, been a little harsh, the closing words are actually worse. <laughs> if this is convicting, um, take ownership of it and repent in your own time. I'm not telling you to do anything here. I think this is individual between you and God, between me and God. Every one of us has to deal with those things. But it's imperative for all of us to hold fast to the trials that Yahweh allows in our lives. And you know, we all deal with different levels and lengths of a trial. Everything is a season. I'm sure you guys have read the Bible in the book of Ecclesiastes. There's a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to be born, a time to die, and the list goes on. Right? And so, if you're in a season right now where things are hunky-dory, enjoy it. Blessings to you. If you're on the on the on the downside of that, and things are not looking so good, find somebody who cares and loves you and listens to you and will allow you to pray with them or, or ask for direction. They're not going to be your savior for that circumstance. No. Don't, don't lean on them as if they're God because that's, that's not fair to them either. But certainly find people directly in your, in your circles, whether it be here, prayerfully it's here, or anywhere wherever that may be, and say, hey, listen, you know, I'm struggling with something right now. Can I talk to you about this? You know, God allowed 
the nation, the children of Israel, to be brought into the, into the ending of that circumstance for, for a twofold purpose. When he brought them into, into Goshen while Joseph was still alive, it was for them to be able to start to come the, the, the beginning, I'm sorry, the beginning of the covenant that God made with Abraham. He was allowing them to multiply as it is that he had promised to Abraham that he was going to be, through him, it was going to be the, the growth and development of his people. But on the other side of that, he allowed them to fall into the circumstance because he needed, the, he needed to bring them to the promised land. And if it wasn't because there was a Pharaoh who did not know Joseph, and eventually that relationship would be severed, where they would actually be made uh, slaves, and then eventually God would allow them to be exiled, that second portion also had a benefit. It was painful. It was hard. I'm sure living in that condition wasn't an easy thing. But God allowed it to be that way because there was a, there was, there's a, a grander, bigger purpose than that which we understand. You know, it's, it's way easier to be a trash bag. Walking around as a receptacle, a receptacle of the vice, getting filled with, uh, with envy, anger, and jealousy, cantankerousness. I can just keep adding things to it. We've all done it. I mean, I think we've all done it. I can't, I can't place blame on everybody. I, I, I only know really myself, but I think that's pretty common, right? So I hope that you got the picture that I was trying to paint to you. I'm trying to remember a story that I heard once from a, from a, from a preacher that I respect very much. He's gone, on, gone home to be with the Lord quite a while ago. But he said a story about a, about a girl who had taken a first aid class, and she was really proud of it. And uh, her study group was having a meeting where they were going to be able to share a testimony night. And so she decided to go, and she, start, she started to tell her story about this event. And she said, right in front of my house happened the most horrible accident I've ever witnessed. This elderly man lost control of his car, went over the curb, and went head on onto an oak tree. He got ejected from his car. He landed on the ground, and his head split like, a, like an eggshell. His life's blood was pumping out. It was horrible, she said. As I got there, I was the first one on the scene, and then I remembered my first aid. I remember that if I put my head between my knees, I would not pass out. And that was, that is a lot of times, what the church wants to do. It wants to put, it, put its head between its knees because they're only caring about themselves. We can't think that way. I know we don't like it. I said it already many, many times, and I don't want to end the, the, the service repetitive again. But nevertheless, let it be said that He has a plan and a purpose for your life, as you already know. It's not like you've never heard that before. And His plan is to, turn, to, to conform you into the image of His Son, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we want to take the opportunity to uh, seal that which You've allowed us to take onto our hearts. You've allowed us to uh, take and to uh, match up with what it is that Your Word says, with the things that we are falling short on. And we just want to ask you to, uh, to allow us to lay that at the foot of your cross. You, are, you allow us, Lord, to, uh, to take another stab at it, whatever that may be. Let each and every one of my brothers and sisters here take reflection on themselves. This is not an uh, elbow message for the person sitting next to somebody else. We are ever so grateful that you've allowed us to have this alive 
and breathing book in our hands, representative of your character. And that is what is our ultimate desire for life. We don't want to just be tea bags, as I said earlier. We want to be the best tea bags that were ever created. Certainly want to put aside the opportunity to ever pick up a, ourselves and be used as a trash bag. So we thank you, Lord, for the time, the opportunity. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.